I claim silver has a bigger short position relative to anything else than even they had in Tesla, the short position. So it's not unreasonable to imagine as and when we get short covering in silver, okay, which hasn't occurred yet, um, that uh, its performance might mirror the performance in Tesla stock. I'm you know, just about certain uh, that there's going to be some kind of um, failure uh, on the big shorts uh, part in, in silver. Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. And a little bit of a Christmas present for you today because on the line with me, I have someone who's been a key figure in this entire saga that we now all follow on a daily basis together about silver manipulation and J.P. Morgan and spoofers and regulatory agencies that seem to go out of their way to avoid commenting on what's happening, which is, again, why I think we're all quite fortunate for Ted Butler, who's been digging into this story for years sharing what he's found so that people like me could be here and even know that there was something. I don't know, Ted, maybe I would have figured something out eventually because I think whether one way or another, people look at the price of silver, they look at what's happening in the world, it doesn't make sense, and you've been one of the leaders in explaining that. So welcome on in here today. It's great to catch up with you again, and how are you doing? Good, Chris. Thanks for that uh, that welcome. Uh, I'm doing just fine. Yeah, well, uh, it was nice uh, to see you at Silverfest, where I think the interest for silver was growing. And then, geez, it's already a couple months later. A lot has happened since then, although I was thinking it might be fun to start in reverse today. And we'll get into some of the things and the details that are happening but in terms of how this plays out in the end, do you think we're headed to some sort of failure eventually? And if so, what is it? What do you think happens after that goes down? Uh, well, yeah. To, to answer the question, I, I, I'm you know just about certain uh, that there's going to be some kind of um, failure uh, on the big shorts uh, part. In silver, the only thing you can't, <clears throat> excuse me, be uh, presumptuous enough to uh, proclaim is, you know, when is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? Uh, is it going to happen now? Is it going to happen, you know, this week, this month, uh, in, in, in the relative near future? You, you know, just you have to be a little bit circumspect, and no one can know, you know, exactly when when things are going to happen. People aren't or aren't profits you you try and be analytical and consider things as uh, as best you can so you don't want to put a time specific time on it but this has been going on for a long time as you know and uh, these big shorts in, in silver which i claim um there's only a handful of them you can say four you can say eight um there, there's not many of them they're they're mostly banks um, used to be J.P. Morgan. Uh, it's not J.P. Morgan anymore who's short, from from what I can see. I think they passed the hot potato on to these uh, other, uh, call them unsuspecting uh, shorts, that uh, they're now, you know, uh, on, on the firing line. And um, at some point, I, I, you know, a short position is a, is an open transaction that has to be closed out at some point, either by physical delivery or by the purchase, the buyback of the, of the short contract. And uh, one of those two, uh, two things has to happen eventually. And I don't see the big shorts as being in position to deliver the physical. It's, that's easier said than done because there's so many hundreds of millions of ounces involved, um, leaving them the only choice of buying back the 
the short contracts uh, uh, themselves. And if they do that, it's just going to put a, a, a booster, a rocket, uh, under the price of silver as and when they move to cover short. So uh, I would say, you know, eventually it, it is a certainty uh, or as close to a certainty as, as, as you can come. Um, at the timing, I think it's close. I mean, it's uh, these guys are have never been, you know, basically more short than they are now. They don't have the big protector at this moment in J.P. Morgan. Silver is so damn dirt cheap compared to compared to everything else in the world. Certainly gold. Um, that uh, more and more people are going to be questioning you know, why it's so cheap. And if they look not too deep, just deep enough to try and uncover why the price of silver is and has been so cheap, and they focus on this uh, short position, uh, light bulbs should be going off in, in investors' heads around the world. Um, what a What a bargain, what an almost sure thing silver is because of this short position um so that i think that day is is coming close i mean the the best example i can give you is uh currently is uh what happened in the last year year and a half with tesla stock the uh the the the, the, the electric uh vehicle <laughs> battery company um that stock is now up so much. It's like over around $600 billion market cap. Uh, it's worth more than all the major automobile manufacturers combined. That's Ford, General Motors, BMW, Volkswagen, Toyota, Honda. It's like add all the value of all those auto stocks up, and Tesla equals equals the cumulative total. How how did this come about? How did Tesla get to be so, call it overvalued, even though it might go a lot higher, but it's certainly overvalued compared to every other automobile company out there. And the short answer is, is that there was, there's been tremendous short covering in Tesla stock for the last year, year and a half. And that's what's propelled the price so much higher. It hasn't been earnings. It hasn't been uh, any anything that you would think that comes to mind. It's been strictly a, a short covering experience in, in Tesla stock, driven the, the price of the stock up like 20 fold in, in, in a year, year and a half. Um, I claim silver has a bigger short position relative to anything else than even they had in Tesla, the short position. So it's not unreasonable to imagine as and when we get short covering in silver, okay, which hasn't occurred yet, um, that uh, its performance might mirror the performance in Tesla stock going up <laughs> many fold in price, which is, you know, a simple mechanical thing. Ted, that sure is fun to think about Tesla mirroring or silver mirroring Tesla stock. I think there's a few few thousand people around the world listening to this that would be happy with that one. And it's interesting because I remember one time we talked uh, maybe a year or so ago, and I asked you, is there a similar comp? You had mentioned uh, a potato failure. And also, I was listening to one of those Market Wizards books, and they were, one of the traders was talking about what happened when plywood was still back on price controls, and I guess the government was fixing it to, I think it was $110 per whatever unit plywood comes in. But the guy saw it trading over and traded over a couple of days, and he noticed, well, if it trades over a little bit, then it can go a lot. I think it ended up going to $200 or something. Are you familiar with either, uh, perhaps either of those situations and the, the mechanics of how they unraveled and perhaps if that's also similar to what we can see unfold? Uh, sure. Not so much the plywood, but I do remember the 
main potato uh, incident uh, quite uh, distinctly. It took place in the uh, uh, early uh, 70s or so. I was a broker, I believe, at Merrill Lynch, or maybe it was Drexel Burnham at the time. And basically, uh, a big short in, in the market happened to be uh, by the name of J.R. Simplot, who uh, was a big uh, grower of potatoes in Idaho. In fact, he provides uh, provided um, the, the the French fries for uh, for McDonald's, and uh, had taken a big short position in Maine potatoes, and um, basically uh, couldn't get the potatoes, and 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 had to and to, and to had to buy back shorts. It drove the uh, the price of p- p- Maine potatoes up. And so much uh, from, you know, I guess uh, under a buck to over five dollars that they actually closed the exchange and it, they stopped trading uh, in potatoes uh, for that reason. I think the same thing had happened to an earlier onion contract, which you don't even hear anymore. But um, so it can have, um, you know, uh, disastrous results, extreme results. When somebody goes short a large quantity of anything and doesn't have the wherewithal to either deliver the merchandise, in the case of uh, potatoes, the main, main, main potatoes that they, they grow up in northern Maine, or in the case of Tesla stock, where they uh, couldn't obviously didn't have the, the stock to deliver, they had to buy back the shares. Um, in the metals, we've had a recent example, the last several years or so, of this very thing happening in palladium. Uh, palladium used to have, about five years or so ago, don't hold me to the date, a very high concentrated short position similar to silver. And I think for a very short period of time, the concentrated short position in palladium was uh, was actually a little bit higher than it was in silver when you looked at world production and stuff like that. Not for a, a long time, but for a short period of time. Make make a long story short. Uh, at the time, I, th- I believe that the uh, the price of palladium was around three hundred dollars or so when this short position exist existed. And I would claim any large short position like that is an automatic price suppressant depressant. And uh, eventually there got to be a shortage of uh, palladium, which we use in uh, catalytic converters. And uh, the shorts didn't have the material, had to buy back the short position. And we're looking at uh, prices in, on palladium that went as much as 8 to 10 times higher. They're still there. We're still in the low 2000s uh, on, on a palladium. And uh, we no longer have a uh, short position to speak of. Uh, it's all been covered. So there is a long and rich history of people getting over their heads way too short in a particular item. And when they do, it artificially depresses the price initially, and it can last for a long time. It's lasted for decades in, in silver. But when they go to buy back, and eventually the piper has to be paid, a short is an open contract, an open transaction that must be closed. And when they go to close out a short position that got to to be too large, too concentrated, and can't be backed by the real goods, then the only alternative is, is short covering to buy back the position, and invariably, that sends prices to the moon, uh, and that is what I would base uh, a near certainty of silver prices moving substantially higher, even though you can't pinpoint in advance exactly when the unraveling is going to occur. Yeah, and Ted, isn't isn't that basically what happened? Leading, I mean, in the 60s, where you have LBJ take the silver out of the coin, leading up to the London gold pool, which, uh, because I know you get these questions, I get them every day, and I understand that for what we do, that's part of our responsibility for people who are saying they're tired of hearing about manipulation, is it ever going to end, how long does it take, yet we do have some comps, 
And would that be another fair comp when you look at what gold has done since the London gold pool unraveled and silver's had a bit of a different chart since then, but is that another good comp of how this eventually unraveled? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I would agree. I mean, I wouldn't call it necessarily a short position, but the London gold pool was, uh, you know, artificially dictating the price and uh you know it wasn't a free market uh, generated price and obviously they uh fixed the price too low and uh, couldn't eventually supp- supply uh the amount of physical metal needed to back up that price so in a sense it was a a short position it's different than than the short position that currently exists in, in COMEX gold in addition to existing in COMEX silver, but it's along those same lines. It's an artificiality. And whenever you mess, it's like messing with the Mother Nature. You start putting in uh, prices that, that, that are not free market generated, and you're eventually going to have problems. You're either going to run out of material, or if you, if you fix it too high, the price you'll have we end up with way too much material that's why you got it's best left to the market open free market for people that uh, uh to decide where to buy and sell when you get overloaded on one side where one side is controlling the equation in the case of the london pool or now in the case of the concentrated comex short position in silver and gold futures Okay, where only a few people, few entities are responsible for on one control one side of the market, in this case the short side, and you got many thousands of people out there, if not millions when you take in the world as a whole, that are uh, on the other side of the transaction, you know, sooner or later, you know, it, it, it's not going to continue where the few can dictate and rig and and control the price. Now, they've done it for an awful long time in both uh, gold and silver, um, but there are stretches, long stretches of time. But when you... When, when it breaks, when it, when it gets relieved or when the, con, when the concentration gets broken, you have this shoot up in price. We've seen that over the years. It, you know, silver 50 years ago, you know, it was a dollar an ounce or something like that. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's no longer that. Um, I claim it's still, you know, ultra depressed in price because of this documented, concentrated short position we got four traders four banks on the comex that are short 300 million ounces they have no reason to be short 300 million ounces there's not a legitimate explanation in the world for why someone be so reckless and 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 stupid to be short 300 million ounces you can't come up no one can come up with a a real legitimate explanation for why silver is vastly overpriced and needs to be shorted okay to that extent otherwise we would see the reason everybody's basically bullish on silver thinking that the price is cheap what do these four guys or eight guys know that that uh, has put them uh, short so heavily, so it's such a such a massive amount? There should be an explanation. It's not mining companies, okay? They have to disclose that publicly. It's not anybody that owns silver because if you own silver and you didn't, you thought it was going to go down, you sell it. You don't. You just liquidate it and take the money. Uh, you don't go short against it. It's like it doesn't. It doesn't pay. So if there's a legitimate reason for four traders to be short 300 million ounces, I have yet to uncover it. And I've been looking for 35 years. I've asked the regulators, the CFTC, the damn Justice Department, the CME Group, J.P. Morgan, everybody. Nobody talks. Everybody, the cat's got all their tongues, okay? And no one can come up with a half-hearted sounding explanation legitimate explanation for why four traders would be short 300 million ounces of silver and that on its face 
tells you that the the dam position is manipulative and illegitimate. Yeah, well, I'm sure the CFTC is going to be all over that anytime soon now. Um, Ted, you mentioned palladium, which uh, makes me want to toss in my platinum question real quick. I don't think we've discussed this before, and I'd be intrigued your answer here. Um, what we have discussed, and I know you heard the Bart Shelton interview, he confirms they took over the bear position. The thing was too big. He told them to make it smaller, and they were making it bigger. And that silver had risen over the previous six months from 13 to 21 amid the exact reasons why people buy silver, because you have banks failing, Fed's doing historic interest rate cuts, and just coincidentally, silver starts plunging. Not shortly after that deal, but I think it was two or three days. So my question yeah, to you, yeah. Ted, um, and you may have seen that in some of those confessions to the Department of Justice, they did also mention rigging platinum and palladium too. I might add they also mentioned rigging the options. So basically a lot of the time they, these geniuses, they talk about their derivative book. Basically, they're just selling insurance contract and rigging the price. But that aside, Ted, would it strike you as odd that platinum, at its all-time high of $2,300, coincidentally, two weeks before that Bear Stearns J.P. Morgan deal? Uh, no, it doesn't strike me at all, uh, you know, out of place. I, I, I think every metal contract maybe with the exception of copper okay where the banks don't participate or not on the short side anyway of of copper but on on all the other uh, precious metals that trade on the on the comex nymex under the the cme group umbrella uh, gold silver platinum palladium they all have a massive a concentrated short position, a big short position held by uh, a few banks, uh, and a little less so in, in palladium now that the price has gone up so much, but certainly that's true in uh, in silver, gold, and, and, and platinum. So, yeah, I, I would say for sure there is a manipulation for the very same by the very very same mechanism that exists in, in silver, namely many contracts, disproportionate number of contracts being held by just a one or two or a handful of traders, uh, invariably banks. Okay, and uh, you couldn't find um, clearer proof of, of of a manipulation. The, the government's own definition the cftc's own definition of manipulation is basically a concentrated position that's why they provide detailed concentration data on both the long and short side of every commodity traded that's included in the commitment of traders reports they're not keeping and publishing the concentration data for no good reason. The good reason is it's there, they monitor it, they publish it, because it's the, it's the front line, early warning, the NORAD incoming missile, okay, warning system for manipulation. <laughs> the problem is the damn regulators, okay, they got the, 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 the front line warning system there, but the, the screen is showing incoming missiles up the yin yang, okay, and they're doing nothing about it. That's the crazy thing about it. They, they're the ones that, I didn't invent the term concentration. I got it off from the CFTC in their own data, in their own commitment of traders data, every long form report on any commodity that the CFTC publishes has concentration data. It's, it's there for a reason. The problem is these guys are so twisted, uh, these regulators, they've forgotten, you know, what it's there for. And they don't they won't they certainly won't answer questions about it. They did a, a number of years ago, back in 2004 and in 2008, 
they put out these 15-page letters separately, that uh, public letters that tried to explain the situation away. It was uh, as clear as mud, and they and they and they didn't even they didn't even acknowledge that that Bear Stearns had gone out of business because it was the largest concentrated short in in gold and silver. But since then. They've like uh, clammed up. They they don't want to address this situation. You know, you can be you know put be an ostrich and put your head in the sand for so long, but now it's like ridiculous. You got these glaring concentration on the short side. Certainly, silver leads the the pack. Then comes platinum. Then comes gold. So yeah, you're you're making a very good observation with those three metals. There, there is a concentration up the yin yang, okay, on the short side. There's no big concentration on the on the long side, and the CFTC won't do anything about it. Yeah, which is the frustrating part because, I mean, we've seen that happen before. I mean, yeah, Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme. For anyone who doesn't remember, or never heard of them, there was the guy, the analyst Harry Markopoulos read his book years ago where he was telling the SEC, I believe as early as 2004, and for whatever reason they didn't like him or maybe they had a vested interest. But, you know, again, the thing gets bigger, more people lose money. Um, I mean, Ted, would you say it's analogous to if you had a home security system and the thing's going off because someone's robbing the house now, yet you know, the security guard is, like, watching an episode of the Three Stooges, has the alarm on mute, he's got, like, some donuts, you know, sugar on his fingers, while people are walking out of the house with the goods. Exactly. In fact, I, I remember writing a, uh, an article uh, many years ago, uh, I think titled something like uh, 911, you know, with the problem being, it's like, calling uh, 911 and uh, there's nobody pick up the phone it's like uh, you could you could dial 911 to the the CFTC about concentration and manipulation and uh, it's like the keystone cops so yeah it's a, it's like a perfect <laughs> example of what you used okay now Ted, i'm going to ask you an unfair completely trick question but maybe you'll be a good sport and indulge me but Maybe there's no answer to this, but does it does it seem odd that now even you had this nine hundred twenty million dollar fine, yet still even have the criminal you know Department of Justice saying they're a criminal enterprise, yet we still see the same exact thing happen repeatedly. I mean, weekly, sometimes almost daily. Absolutely. Uh, well, I mean, it, it was like clear from the start when they first announced this uh, investigation, the first guilty plea uh, a couple of years back. Um, it was they laid out the the, the case, the, the Justice Department, and it, uh, it was all concerning spoofing, which is very short term trading. It's like you put in an order and uh, you immediately cancel it, and that constitutes a uh, you know, a violation of commodity law, which is all well and good, and I don't think they should allow spoofing, but by sticking to spoofing, as that was the end-all and be-all for the the manipulation of prices that's going on in, in gold and silver and other markets, okay, that was nuts. I mean, it wasn't spoof. Spoofing was one of many tools that these bank crooks use uh, to manipulate the price, but by the you know the the, the Justice Department CFTC uh, sticking exclusively, putting the blinders on, and sticking exclusively to spoofing and pretending not to notice the bigger manipulation that's out there, the concentrated short position, okay, was such a disservice that you knew that if they stuck to just spoofing, that J.P. Morgan was going to skate out of this unharmed, and that's exactly what they did. Had the Justice Department and the CFTC dare address 
the major issue, the concentrated shorting by J.P. Morgan for more than eight or nine years in which it depressed prices, turned around and bought a billion ounces of silver and 25 million ounces of gold at a minimum at the depressed prices it itself created with their paper short sales, okay, if they'd open their eyes and and check into that, they would see that this is much bigger than this settled this this phony settlement that they came up with with J P Morgan. But let's face it, you gotta be realistic here. There's no way that the Justice Department or the CFTC can now go after J P Morgan or anybody else on the COMEX for what I allege, what's been going on for all these years, because they've both been denying it for so long that if the Justice Department now came up or the CFTC now came up and said, okay, hey, we see some big wrongdoing here, they would get laughed out of existence because the obvious question would be, where the hell you been for the last 30 years? Okay, why didn't you see it sooner? And they know that, the Justice Department, the CFTC, they can't dare, okay, breathe uh, any kind of a word or sign, okay, that there is something wrong after denying it for so long, they're trapped. They they can't do it. But it doesn't matter. It's not something they get down about because they can't do anything anyway. When there's when the physical shortage hit, as it seems to be uh, developing now, and these big shorts who are still short that that j p Morgan double crossed them and dumped the whole problem on these remaining shorts okay when they uh, start I- experiencing more severe losses than they've experienced in the last year, which is the largest they've ever experienced before and and start to buy back uh, in short positions and drive this price to the moon um What's the CFTC going to do or the Justice Department going to do here? They can't come in. They're not going to go short uh, in their place. Uh, They're going to have to sit by sucking their thumbs and watch something unfold that had the regulators taken the time to do the right thing years ago when it was pointed out to them clearly. They might have had a chance of doing something that wouldn't be as disruptive in price. Now nah, it's too far gone. The, the CFTC and the Justice Department are just useless. They're, they're not gonna, they're not gonna participate. I don't think in this, in any way. They're not gonna come in and, and, and save the silver and gold investor or anything like that or straighten anything out. It, that, we don't need them though. It's like it's so far gone. It's, uh, we're gonna leave it up to the free market. And if these guys who are short, these massive quantities of gold and silver and platinum, okay, can can figure out, you know, a way of, of turning, uh, you know, water into silver or uh, lead into gold, then good luck. Let, let them do it. I don't think they, they stand a chance when they start to panic uh, in earnest and, and buy back. No one can say, okay. I think it's soon, but I always think it's soon. It's so lopsided and so egregious that it should have happened long ago. Uh, when it happens, it happens. But it looks for sure it has to happen at some point. Well, I appreciate that. Although, Ted, if you could keep it down a little bit there, um, I think it is nap time <laughs> at the CFTC right now. So we do not want go. to be too, too loud. Um, last one I have for you. You talk at Silverfest about the turnover on the COMEX, how metals being shifted in and out of various warehouses. Any update, uh, anything additional that's been happening or that changed since then, or how is that looking right now? Uh, it ha- it's cooled off a bit. It hasn't disappeared. Sil- silver still has the silver warehouse movement is still, you know, unprecedented, larger than than any other uh, uh, commodity. But uh, it, it happens to be taking, I guess, a back seat now to uh, developments uh, on the paper market. Where you know, whereas uh, J P Morgan's kind of slipped out the back and uh, left the uh, the other big shorts holding the bag. 
and uh, you know we got all this uh, demand for uh, for for physical silver on both a wholesale retail basis. It's like other things are coming in to overshadow it. I still maintain, of course, that for the last nine years this unusual physical turnover of silver in the COMEX warehouses, which is still occurring at a, at a rate not seen in any other commodity, um, is a strong indication of wholesale physical demand. Uh, but what's holding it back, and, I, and I, the price back, what I, is, is still these, these few shorts that are, I think, hanging on by, by their fingertips on a, on a window ledge, um, and not to let go, okay, because the minute they stop selling, uh, adding short positions, the price is, uh, is, is gonna go up, and if they turn around and try and buy back their short positions, they're gonna meet the same fate that every overly short, uh, entity has ever met throughout history. Prices will explode when these guys uh, start to run for cover, which it looks like they're going to have to do uh, at some point. Well, may we both have large call option positions on whenever that does finally go down. Ted, can't thank you enough for the call as always today. Before we wrap up, can you let folks know, and for anyone who may be finding out about this the first time, um, fortunately, Ted's been kind enough to explain and write this all in a newsletter twice a week. So if you're sitting there hearing this and thinking, gee, this sounds quite intriguing and like a useful thing to know before it imploded, similar to the folks who understood that mortgages had to come down. I think it's a very analogous situation that, Ted, fortunately, you keep us up to date with. Can you let folks know where they can find the newsletter? Sure. Just, you know, go to Google or regular search on the Internet and type in... Uh, 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 butlerresearch.com and uh, you'll, you'll come to the, the website there's, there's plenty of free articles if you want to uh, try a, a subscription for, for a month or so it, it's often on that basis and you know there's a couple of uh, articles per week uh, so you'll, you'll be able to catch up pretty quick well it's one of my favorites Ted you're one of my favorites in the silver world I know there's a lot of people out there who are really grateful for all that you do and stand for. So thanks again for giving us an update. Happy holidays. And, yeah, hopefully we'll see uh, some numbers bigger than a five in front of that silver price in 2021. Sounds great. Look forward to it. Take care, Chris. I'm you know, just about certain uh, that there's going to be some kind of um, failure uh, on the big shorts uh, part in, in silver. 